All right, ladies and gentlemen in the audience and everybody watching from home, hi mom, I finally made it. Thanks very much for being here for today. My name is Jim St. Clair. I'm the executive director for Linux Foundation Public Health and thrilled to have the opportunity to get included in the agenda to talk about a industry specific use case on digital twins. Even more stoked about the discussions we've been having with digital twins, AWS presentation discussion, digital twins. Stephen, thank you for the shout out today in connection with the academic OSPO and open data and wanted to walk through some aspects in an industry specific application and why we think digital twins are, are so exciting. So just to kind of normalize around the definition for a digital twin, it gets used various ways, but for the sake of the discussion today, we'll just, uh, we'll just grab this out of Gartner. As you can see, it's really the implementation of a digital twin as some sort of encapsulated software object or model that mirrors a unique physical object process, organization, et cetera. Uh, and as you can see there is the example built around a power um, uh, wind generation source, you have a physical model, physical existing model of something, a wind tower and a wind generator, and then you have all of the various inputs that come from that in data and integration, then combined into a UX to be able to give you a digital representation of what that thing is, or a digital twin as we call it. And we're going to spend a few minutes talking about the different types of digital twins, even then how that name is used for different things um, and where we see it going in healthcare. And of course, the really cool things that we're doing in the Linux Foundation that I believe are on the cusp of building some great opportunities for new software uh, directions and stuff to go with digital twins. So let's talk about the evolution of kind of where we got here, at least from my perspective. First of all, good old Moore's law and computational scale. Uh, the fact that we get more and more processing out of physically less and less um, physical computational systems like chipsets and CPUs, and of course now we're in the day and age of, of SOX systems on a chip, uh, the ability to integrate both a CPU and a GPU simultaneously in a small space, which gives you the ability to put things at a much more dynamic scale for integration and platforms. Second of all, the growth of embedded devices in IoT, uh, which of course has been going through its own sort of uh, machinations and scaling and the ability to deliver more and more computational power and other um, um, embedded capabilities like uh, visual collection, camera sort type systems, uh, electro-optical, audio, et cetera, that get built into IoT. And of course, now we're talking almost nanoscale IoT applications in healthcare, the ability to swallow something that takes measurements or readings from inside your body as a system, um, nanoscale uh, robots for um, um, pharmaceutical delivery or chemotherapy delivery, et cetera. Then, of course, there's also the growth of analytics and the evolution of AI and ML and the ability to do large-scale processing on massive data sets rapidly collected. That's obviously a big focus of what we've talked about here in terms of the applications for AI and data sets for graphical rendering, for uh, um, game scenario rendering, and I think a lot of that maps to digital twins. And then finally, the evolution of the old green screen uh, flashing prompt UI UX that we all started off in computers uh, to 3D, AR, VR, MR, uh, that Royal has talked about quite a bit. Uh, so all of that to me kind of sets up where we're going with this concept of, of digital twins. There's basically five functional groupings around digital twins. It's kind of a way to look at architecturally and from a business process standpoint where things fall into. So if you have a digital twin in the middle, there are functional groups, as you can see here, data processors, data science, visualization, process mining, data collection, all of the things that kind of relate to that evolution I just referred to on the previous slide that are now kind of functional groupings and components to what help constitutes a digital twin. And a digital twin may be called by name to include uh, one or more of these, or may have all five, depending on the specific applications that we're looking at. Stole this from a, a friend of mine at another digital twin company, kind of gives you a digital twin stack concept to break down. Uh, once again, as we talked about through all of those uh, evolutionary steps, you see the aspects of supported devices, which uh, include various aspects of UI and UX at the mobile level, AR and VR. The front end services leveraging uh, internet connectivity, APIs, 3D engines, et cetera, analytics and automated automation in various ways. And I think, and, and the folks here, of course, can correct me, but I think this kind of also relates to what we talk about 
from a game structure as well as how those pieces are put together to emulate and substantiate something that you're using as a avatar or in this case for a digital twin. And of course the data engine and then what the source systems are. So to talk specifically about where some of the things are going in digital twins from a healthcare perspective, first of all, you have like process digital twins. These most, close, most closely relate to other digital twins in other industries where you have large scale processes or functions that are going on that you're emulating or modeling in a digital twin model. Top photo is from a digital twin um, uh, from a small company working with Singapore General Hospital. They have a really cool digital twin of the hospital itself. And in doing so, they're using it for things like we identify in room 218 that someone is now positive for COVID. We want to use a digital model for the flow of patients and traffic around the hospital to understand if there's an exposure threat as that person from 218 or the medical staff from 218 moves from room to room. What do we know about the flow of the hospital uh, that potentially assists us with compromise risk? Or maybe I'm gonna layer the HVAC system on top to say, well, if 218 is contaminated, do we know something about the model of the airflow around the, around the hospital to know that 218 could spread contamination into the east wing because of the HVAC flow patterns? So that's a way that processes are used. System digital twins refer specifically to um, human bodily systems, cardiovascular, um, neurology, etc. cetera. Uh, Dassault Systems uh, has put in a lot of time and effort around what they call the Living Hearts, about a 10-year-old project. And as you can see from that shot there, they've actually come up with a digital emulation of the heart that researchers can use to come in and either evaluate things like surgical techniques, um, other aspects of physical development or physical abnormalities. Um, what happens if I introduce certain chemicals and certain pharmaceuticals in with the heart and the cardiovascular system. So that's an example where a system is being modeled. And then where I think and other folks are, are talking about is the kind of the holy grail, the digital twin of a patient. Something that rem represents you as a system of systems view, a amalgamation of all of your systems and body and what we call genomic, your genetic makeup, uh, biomic, the stuff that you put into your body, and exomic, the factors in the environment. And how do we combine those all together to be able to get a digital twin of Jim where he's living in Houston in a certain area, uh, has a certain lifestyle, and maybe by genetic makeup might be prone to certain conditions and take all that into effect to help map their patient medical journey going forward. So some of the unique things about healthcare, specifically for digital twins, is that you know, other in, all industries model or simulate critical processes and sensitive data. Uh, additionally, we have unique considerations for data in healthcare, as many of you are aware. First of all, if we're going to do a digital twin for a patient, it's one thing if we get it wrong for a wind tower. It's another thing if we get it wrong with patient data for life safety or medical delivery. So the criticality associated with not only the computers and the systems and the process and the data are important, but how they're used. And I think where open source plays an important role is transparency in the processes, in the data science, in the aggregation models to be able to say, yes, this is a clinically evidence-based standard that we're using as part of this AI ML process that's gonna help drive a digital twin for the liver uh, so that we make sure clinically we get it right and that in information isn't improperly used or a proprietary black box model doesn't result in um, some mistake being made in the clinical standards that results in patient error. And we all know patient error is a very bad thing. Uh, regulatory requirements, and this varies from place to place and state to state, but most importantly, um, uh, HIPAA, which is the Health Information Portability and Accountability Act, has kind of sat as the standard for regulations around personal health information or protected health information, and that has to be taken into account when you're using systems as well. And then lastly, we have a rapidly growing, rightfully, uh, concern about privacy and ethics in things like digital models and AI and ML, specific to healthcare and information. Most importantly, I think, is the fact that there's more ethical concerns about biases that are 
um, unintentionally included as part of, say, training sets for AI and ML, uh, modeling data that is used, and whether or not it is completely inclusive and, uh, um, and represents uh, the diversity of the so different populations. Um, there are challenges with whether or not certain diseases are looked at that are all encompassing of, of women, people of color, certain geographic areas, et cetera. And all that has to be considered if you're gonna take the next step to what a digital twin of a patient is. Well, who is that patient? What's their geographic socioeconomic background? Do we have the right data sets on those individuals to consider for this? So uh, both the uh, Linux Foundation Public Health and LF Networking are involved with the Digital Twin Consortium that is part of the Object Management Group. Um, and uh, I've also been involved with their Security and Trustworthiness uh, uh, Working Group. And we just recently came up with this publication around a framework for trustworthiness uh, for digital twins and digital twin technology. And as I go through in the next couple of slides, I think it's a perfect opportunity to be involved with some of the other aspects of Linux Foundation activities in Hyperledger, uh, Open Wallet Foundation, and others, where we're looking at things like decentralized identity, zero trust architecture models, et cetera, uh, that are necessary for that privacy and that security. And for anybody who was in the metaverse wallet discussion yesterday, I think Ori Steele did a great job in mentioning the word confidentiality as something above and beyond just the concept of privacy, but how am I maintaining data integrity and confidentiality for that data and that privacy? So as a result, because of uh, where I'm tinkering around in other areas of decentralized identity and verifiable credentials, something else we talked about in the Metaverse presentation yesterday, um, I think there's a lot of application for these other Linux Foundation projects, W3C standards, et cetera, to apply within a digital twin model. And as is noted here, digital twins and IoT are rapidly growing in their power and emulation and real world response. That's obviously a big thrust of what we're talking about this week. Uh, as a result, they are assuming identities onto themselves. So imagine if I have a digital twin of a patient, me, um, to what extent am I now defining in terms of regulation or in terms of ethics that that uh, digital twin is as much me from a protected health information standpoint as if I presented my data to you personally, uh, personally as a physical person? And how do we take that into account in the model? Not only that, but I kind of know how I'm vulnerable to somebody scamming my data or getting my data. What is it in a digital twin model that results in new vulnerabilities or concerns about security framework that we have to consider to make sure we take into account the system integrity of that digital twin and doesn't provide a new attack surface or a route for compromise? So this is why we're talking about things like zero trust architecture, and I'll spend a slide or two about this, and the idea of selective disclosure and zero knowledge proofs, something else we talked about with the use of verifiable credentials and decentralized identity. So just for purposes of basic uh, uh, definition, and I've taken this from a NIST a security publication on zero trust architecture, identity is information on an entity used by computer systems to represent an external client. Now, in the case of um, these uh, security publications, they make account for not only entity identity, physical identity, i.e. you and me, they also talk about non-person entity identity, i.e. an IoT device, a digital twin device, uh, and, and uh, AI ML type agents and models as well to be considered from a zero trust architecture standpoint. So as you can see, identity represents any of the attributes assigned by the enterprise or to authenticate automatic automated tasks. So if you have some agent or you have an IoT device that is part of a digital twin infrastructure and is assigned to report certain pieces of information into that network, into that construct, it has an identity. And most importantly, as we move away from the old security models around identity, it's an ability for that IoT device to, to authenticate and affirm its identity without necessarily sharing too much, and an ability for that IoT device to understand the identity of who it's talking to. So it's a two-way, once again, zero trust. I don't trust you, you don't trust me, so let's broker an architecture of cryptographic trust using something like verifiable credentials to agree that I should be sharing with you this information and you should be receiving it and talking to me. So why is identity important? And I think I probably got ahead of myself a little bit on these slides, but happy to talk through it. Subjects and assets identified as needing assets, asset access, excuse me, as well as continually authenticating and authorizing identity. And, and for those that aren't as familiar with the historical constructs of identity and identity and credential and access management, this is a big step. 
We still, in the 21st century, have identity and access management constructs where you trust some central source, be it an agency, be it um, a central computing system, whatever, and then devices and networks connected to that have to authenticate to say, yes, I'm allowed to be here. Now what we're moving to in a zero trust architecture model is to say, well, I can affirm my, uh, my identity and prove that I'm allowed to be here. You also need to prove to me that I'm talking to the right person in the, in the first place. And, and how do we make sure that we then have bi-directional trust where I'm authorized to share information with you and you're authorized to be talking to me about this information. And this is a big switch. Zero trust has evolved out of some of the things that's happened in the last few years, like uh, the solar winds incident and others where a basic level of access and authentication was compromised and they used that compromise to work their way back up to a central system. And then everybody realized there's something running around in the middle. So now moving to this idea that, well, for any given scenario, whether I'm an IoT device or an AI ML model, I have to be able to prove that I am who I say I am or that I have to be getting this data. Or in the case of a digital twin, Maybe it's a mechanism that allows me to confirm that I'm talking to the right digital twin for me, and that's not some fake model or construct that somebody has put up that's trying to um, steal my identity or, or emulate my identity, and that the data flow between it is correct so that I'm not being improperly represented from a healthcare data information standpoint. So just to kind of build on what we talked about a, a bit about yesterday, this concept of verifiable credentials, uh, Kalia did a great job mentioning verifiable credentials in their background with the W3C standards. Uh, they are basically JSON objects in various flavors. And the cool things about a, a, a verifiable credential is a way to cryptographically uh, represent and present yourself for identity, either on the internet or in a data exchange between two systems, or as I said uh, before, even embedded to an IoT device as part of a network structure of exchanging trust and agreeing. But most importantly, it provides that authenticator to be able to say, I'll share with you X, Y, and Z, but I'm withholding these other things because I don't think you need to know that until we take our authentication to another layer. So that builds in that security and concept around these concepts of verifiable claims and proofs that are cryptographically captured in there. So this kind of puts it all together and you don't have to necessarily strain looking at this eye chart now, but this is a workflow that is represented um, by things such as the Hyperledger uh, Indian Aries program that build in using decentralized architectures for things like decentralized identity communications protocols, verifiable credentials, et cetera, and shows you that workflow about uh, how a verifier checks a verifiable claim, the integration of other enterprise applications, the credential holder, and of course the wallet, which we talked a bit about the wallet and local store yesterday, uh, and then providing zero knowledge proofs or other verifiable presentations. And there's all kinds of things that we can dig into here, but I did want to take the opportunity in the presentation to mention it because I think it's an important part not only of what should be considered for architectures and digital twins, but other ways the Linux Foundation is actively involved on a global basis on other projects uh, contributing to this sort of system. So I'm excited, of course, as I mentioned, not only about Hyperledger, but we're also here from the Open3D Foundation talking about uh, the role for digital twins. LF Networking and LF Edge both have important aspects of uh, 5G and AI and uh, network computing and edge computing that all build into uh, constructs for digital twins and digital twin information sources. As I mentioned, LF Networking and LF Public Health both have MOUs with the Digital Twin Consortium where more practitioners are over there and various open standards and specifications are developed in conjunction with our technologies. Cloud is obviously an important part of what we're talking about in terms of digital twins and gaming systems and the like, uh, LFAI, and then Hyperledger for some of those uh, security components that I mentioned. So let's start something. I really, and I just threw this slide in last night because I think this is a great audience and I think we have a great opportunity listening to some of our keynotes and presentations and discussions on it. I'd like to imagine the concept of an open source uh, health digital twin center of excellence. Um, 
I, I have a number of collaborations with academic medical centers that are building uh, to include UC Davis Health, which just joined. They're one of 12 um, um, cloud innovation centers with AWS. And of course, AWS is very active in contributing to this space. Um, academic medical centers are very interested in expanding into AR and VR and digital twins as next generation technology. And I think it's a great uh, living lab for being able to work on some of these projects. I want to bring together technology contributors, uh, identify what are the gaps and the needs for standards and specifications that either Linux Foundation can contribute, OMG can contribute, W3C can contribute, et cetera. That's something that we do very well. And I think I'll have a Slack channel or a sign up page forthcoming. And I am in the Open3D um, Discord. I think I introduced myself and threw out, hey, I'm interested in digital twins. And, you know, kind of got a yeah, yeah, but that's fine. I think we just need to get a little more focus and we can, uh, we can build a channel type activity up around that. And that was it. I'm sorry, I think that was kind of quick, but I am open to any questions and further discussion however you'd like to. Steven, sir. Just, I, I think, can you go backwards? I can, I can go backwards, yep. So I, I think there's room for an open source digital twin center of excellence that then has medical Sorry, I'm repeating myself for the audience, right? Yeah. I, I think we can do a, a Center for Excellence at Digital Twins umbrella and then health and the other things underneath. So that way we've got kind of stuff that propagates across. That's my only comment there. Oh, so other industry sectors or applications are referring to? Right, there, yeah. I, you know, I mean, there seems to be some basic issues across Digital Twins and then there's specific different kinds, right? Mm -hmm. So I'd, I'd rather see a push for the big one with the, the specialties rather than numerous different ones, but a, a center of excellence overall for digital twins seems to make sense. Uh, no, I think that's legitimate. You know, obviously I'm sticking to my knitting on the, on the healthcare side, but, uh, but being broader, I think if you go back to that slide then, and say, hey, how is each of this contributing and how would we construct a, an umbrella sort of effort around it is, is absolutely welcome for consideration, so. Yes. Hold on, let me Hold get on. you She's the get, microphone. He's got to pass you the microphone for the audience back home. <laughs> we should have those in every room, yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, well, first of all, thank you so much for leading this effort. Um, and um, this is so important to us. Uh, I remember Dan Cohn was the founder of the, the Public Health. Dan was. He did a wonderful job setting this up, and unfortunately, yeah. I didn't get a chance to really know. Yeah. yeah. So I really think this is uh, such a good um, project. So um, uh, um, you've been talking a lot about digital twins. Um, I'm curious about robotics. Um, is there a connection there? Because you know. One thing, you, you, well, digital twins to me is more like you're working things in the virtual space. But then in order to really realize the value of digital twin, you can use robotics to operate on patients or whatever. So is there any kind of work that's being done in that area? If there's work being done there, I don't know it, but that doesn't mean I don't agree with you 100%. And to use the healthcare example, you may be familiar, the Da Vinci robot for surgery has grown up tremendously. Well, I remember talking with, uh, uh, unfortunately, a, surger, a surgeon that we were consulting with who is like a legend in the hospital he's in. He's pioneered some procedures. He is, has done over a thousand procedures in certain ways. And I remember him standing there and saying, yeah, you know, the Da Vinci robot, you still gotta be a surgeon behind there doing it. And he said, I don't even like the Da Vinci robot. And he wasn't just being an old curmudgeon, but he pointed out reasons why as a robot, it wasn't quite there yet because of the, the, the surgeon that still had to be in the loop. But if we start to visualize, I think the concept of, well, could a digital twin do that? Could the surgeon be in the loop on more than one digital twin that's operating uh, robotic platforms? What does the robotic platform need to do to improve to accommodate use of those digital twins? I think it's a great idea. I think it's a, certainly an area to expand. I'm not involved with any of the open robotic type platforms now, but I think it's a great overlap or consideration. So. Sure. Um, yep, one online. I would love to hear, hear your thoughts on what are the most important use cases that O3DE should be focused on for the digital twin use case. What is needed for these types of users to get started? 
That's a wonderful question. And, um, and this presentation was part of my effort to kind of educate the audience on, on that discussion. I would love to explore that, and I would be happy to dive into the Discord channel and talk about it. There may be things in, in the Open 3D Foundation that you're doing that I'm not entirely aware of, and I know obviously digital twins have come up, um, but I think some of the work, um, the overlapping work on AR and VR and, uh, and modeling. There's a discussion, I think, after mine about um, rendering for digital twins, um, the, the digital emulation of a twin and the relationship to avatars and processing. I think there's a lot to sort through there that we could, we could focus in on. Most importantly, there's things that are going on with, with other, as I mentioned, academic medical centers and the like that I'd love to be able to come back to the Open 3D Foundation, engage in conversation and say, Hey, y'all, I just talked to University of Rochester Medical Center, and they're very interested in digital twins around X, and it involves these processes. Are these, are these things that you're working on or modeling now? Is there something in the Open 3D engine we could leverage? Are there other things in development? Are there recommendations around types of languages to choose? I think it's a bit open to explore. So I don't have a perfect answer, but I think it's a, it's a great area to discuss the collaboration, and I'd love to hear more from the participants of what their thoughts were. You know, I can offer the healthcare use case, but, but I look to the experts involved and the, the contributors in open source to be able to say, oh, Jim, what you really need is some Python that's written and do this, and you're able to tackle that. That's what I can, I can work with. Great. Hello, welcome. We're just at questions. <laughs> that's okay. It's okay. Any other questions? And if not, I greatly appreciate your time. Great to be here. And don't hesitate to catch up with me if there's anything else that I can share with you. So thank you very much. Yeah.